warm welcome to everyone and thank you for joining this live Harman's Talk event. My name is Nigel Hawkins and I am the Infrastructure Analyst at Harman & Co. These events give investors the chance to hear a company's investment case and to question the management. Today we are hosting a presentation from BBGI. BBGI is a diversified and social infrastructure investment company, which is regulated in Luxembourg. BBGI is a FTSE 250 company, currently capitalized at around 1.2 billion pounds. Its major investment markets are infrastructure assets in Canada and in the UK. Importantly, virtually all BBGI's revenues are public sector backed and are based on the availability of, and not the demand for that asset. As such, its revenue risk is very low, which gives rise to a stable cash flow and rising dividends. Since its IPO just over a decade ago, BBGI can boast of an impressive record of total shareholder return, up by 10.4% per year since 2011. We are very lucky to have both BBGI's co-chief executives here this afternoon, Frank Schramm and Duncan Ball. Frank has worked in the infrastructure sector, investment banking and advisory business for over 25 years. At BBGI, he is responsible for overall strategy and management. Duncan has worked in the infrastructure sector, investment banking and advisory business but for over 30 years. At BBGI, he is also responsible for overall strategy and management. So without further ado, could I ask Frank, who's going to present first, to start his presentation? Over to you, Frank. Nigel, thanks for your kind introduction. And good afternoon to everyone uh, on the call. And uh, thanks for joining the Hartman Talks today. Um, my name is Frank Schramm, as Nigel said, and uh, I will start with the presentation. And halfway through, I will hand over to Duncan. This slide presents the fundamentals of BBGI and our investment proposition. Um, we are a global social infrastructure investor with a low risk investment strategy, and we're focused on delivering long term attractive and sustainable return. So how do we deliver that? Our business model is actually based on four strategic pillars, starting with no low risk. All our investments are availability based. That means we don't invest in the higher risk asset classes such as toll roads or regulated assets. So we basically at the bottom end of the infrastructure business, infrastructure sector investment business. The revenues come from the public sector or public sector uh, back counterparties, and that obviously helps tremendously to provide stable and predictable cash flows, and that is also coupled with progressive long-term dividend growth. The second pillar is our, our global diversification pillar, and is based on our focused exposure in AAA and AA rated countries only. And again, that provides stable, well-developed value, uh, operating environment. And although we have got a global portfolio, we're serving actually local communities. The third pillar is our strong ESG approach. ESG is integrated in all our business model. Here it is integrated in investment committee meetings, asset management, risk management, compliance, governance. Here and our portfolio has a strong social impact. While on the other hand, it actually shows a high degree of climate resilience. Additionally, compensation of, uh, of Duncan, my, myself, our CFO and the wider executive team yeah, is also linked to ESG performance. The fourth pillar is our internally managed structure. And there, we are the only infrastructure company here yeah, was managed in-house. And our interests are aligned with that of our investors. We focus on delivering shareholder value by being incentivized by share returns and NAV per share growth, and importantly, not actually portfolio growth. The quantitative benefit of that is that we're also offering a very competitive low ongoing charge. That slide presents the financial highlights for the year 2021. The NAV has grown by 9.4% to just over a billion, but even more importantly, the NAV per share has grown 2.1% to 140.7 pence per share. As for the last year, uh, last 10 years, also in 2021, we achieved our dividend target of 7.33 pence. And we reconfirm our dividend targets for 2022 and for 2023, and also pleased to introduce a new target for 2024. And that also demonstrates our confidence in our arguably boring but attractive and reliable business model. Dividend cover was strong for the year, 1.31. 
Our annualized return is 10.4%, so it's well above the IRR target of 7 to 8%, at, at which we actually, what there was a target at the IPO. Ongoing charge is 0.86, and we believe very competitive and the lowest in the sector. The five-year better was 0.25, and that demonstrates our shares largely uncorrelated to the wider equity market. That slide presents our robust operating model. Yeah, and that is based on three business principles. Value-driven asset management as a start. We have got a strong portfolio of performance last year of our 54 high-quality availability-based assets. Cash receipts were again ahead of expectation and no material lockups or defaults. And that means there's no covenant breaches of the underlying um, credit facilities of the project companies. And that's quite rare, you know, given that we've got over 50 investments. Active investment, active, active investment activities contributed strongly to our NEV increase by 1.4%. And uh, we also have got to uh, make the assets available or the infrastructure, facilities, schools, hospitals, yeah, and roads available to our clients at a high rate of availability at 99.9%. We had a broad range of ESG initiatives progress last year, and Duncan will talk about that a bit later in the presentation. Prudent financial management is the second uh, pillar of our operating model. And um, with a net cash position of almost 27 million year end, um, we have a progressive dividend growth over the last 10 years of 3.3%. And we had a credit, have credit facility in place to make any acquisitions and where we come later typically back to the market to, re to actually repay that with new equity raises. We did a significant uh, um, 75 million equity raise last year, and it was well oversubscribed and were supported by existing and new investors. We're also the important to know in the current environment, we've got an attractive inflation linkage of about 44 basis points. And that means if um, the inflation is 1% higher than actually our assumptions, the returns go up by about 0.44%. Um, selective acquisition strategy is our third pillar and we focus on availability-based assets only. That has left us to more than more four new investments last year, about 79 million. And post year end, we completed an additional 24 million investment uh, in the first clean energy infrastructure sector. Uh, that obviously helped us to further diversify our social impact portfolio. And we have also got an attractive pipeline in place and we'll provide more information in the second part of the presentation. That slide presents a dividend track record and a projected cash flow from our portfolio. The top chart shows the yearly increase of our dividend over the last 10 years, which averages, averages at 3.3%. At IPO, we promised a progressive dividend and we delivered on our promise. We also set dividend targets to 2022 to 2024. To date, we always delivered on our targets. The chart at the bottom presents our long-term stable and predictable cash flow profile, which comes from our portfolio. And the green part of the columns, which is seen in addition to the, to the blue columns, that is actually the new cash flow coming from our new investments. It's almost a linear extension, so perfect addition with our new investments last year. As a general reminder, the cash flows come from public sector or public sector back counterparty and the contracted nature of our long-term cash flow increase, actually predictability. The top chart presents a total NEV and dividend per share growth. But over the last 10 years, we delivered both um, continuously the NEV and the dividends. So the accumulated NEV per share here started from 97.9 and now it's actually 201.2. The bottom chart compares the total share return of BBGI to FTSE all shares since IPO in 11 and we outperformed the index. NEV return on the right hand side, a couple of the return matrix was 133% or 7.4% on annualized basis. And the dividend yield is around 4.3%. We consider this reliable and attractive in the current market. Total share return of the last seven years, up to 10 years, was 171.1, and your annualized share return of 10.4. That page demonstrates four key strengths of the portfolio. On the top, you see two boring but important facts. We invested 100% availability based PPP assets, so no exposure to higher risk assets. Secondly, while more than 99% of our portfolio in terms of value is operational with minimal construction exposure. On the bottom left, you see that we are truly global. We currently have 36% of the portfolio in Canada. UK is the second largest geography with 33% for Australia, US and continental Europe, all around 10%. And all assets are located in stable, well-developed AAA or AA rated countries. The chart bottom right demonstrates our social impact portfolio. 
with a diversified sector exposure in healthcare, through light and correctional facilities, educational, education, affordable housing and transport. And with that one, I would hand over to Daniel. Uh, thanks, Frank. Um, this slide talks about our approach to ESG. Uh, ESG is a topic that has grown in, in importance over the last decade. And we're very proud of the activities that happen within our portfolio. Uh, we will be producing a 66 page standalone ESG report that'll be out shortly, but I, I just want to take a moment and highlight some of the activities. We use the uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as a framework for identifying our, the ESG activities that occur in our, in our uh, portfolio. We align with um, uh, six, six of the SDGs. At our core is really SDG not, number nine, which is uh, delivering uh, resilient infrastructure uh, and sustainable infrastructure. But we think that we help contribute to good health and well being through our 41 essential healthcare assets. Our 33 schools and colleges provide quality education. Uh, we have 18 transportation projects, including one fully electric public transit system that's powered by green energy. These help create sustainable communities, reduce travel times for over 300 million vehicles each year. And um, the uh, police stations, four, four police stations and four modern correction facilities help deliver on peace, justice and strong institutions. And then uh, We've also set some very uh, ambitious net zero targets. So climate action is very much uh, key to our, um, uh, our ESG approach. And there's quite a bit of disclosure on that in our annual report and in our um, standalone ESG report. We're fully compliant with the uh, Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure. And we also uh, consider ourselves a, uh, under the new EU legislation uh, SFDR, we consider ourselves an Article 8 product, which means that our uh, investments provide social benefits. I wanted to talk about the approach we use for valuation. So the cash flows uh, that come out of our portfolio are discounted using a, an overall portfolio discount rate. That ranges between six and eight, eight and a half percent. The overall portfolio discount rate is 6.55. Uh, the, the management team comes up with its own view of value that is then um, shared with an independent uh, valuation firm who opine on the adequacy of that uh, valuation opinion. And then that is, again, reviewed by our auditors. And both the independent valuer and the auditors have uh, confirmed that the approach we're taking to valuation is, is seen as conservative and prudent. Um, one of the questions we often get in this environment is what, what's happening to discount rates and um, if interest rates back up, are they, what's going to happen to discount rates? You can see over the last decade, uh, headline interest rates have come down and we've benefited from a reduction in discount rates. But you can also see that there's quite a large buffer over the risk-free rates. And our expectation is that uh, if interest rates back up, that buffer will be uh, absorbed some of, some of that. Um, when interest rates were coming down, discount rates were a little slow to follow. Uh, they were sticky. And we think as interest rates back up or, or, or expected to back up, the increase in discount rates won't, won't be quite as quickly as the increase in rates. Um, and we're seeing no evidence of changes in, in market behavior. There's, this is an asset class where there's strong, still very, very strong demand for uh, the, 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 the opportunities we pursue. And we've seen no, no evidence of changes in discount rates. I wanted to talk about our internal management structure. So uh, we think this is a, a key differentiator compared to some of the other uh, funds out there. Um, it means myself and Frank and the rest of the team, we work for the company. We don't work for uh, an advisor that's providing services to the fund. So there's no um, acquisition fees. There's no NAV based uh, management fees. Uh, we have the lowest ongoing charge in the sector at 84, uh, 86 basis points rather. And we think it really creates the alignment of interest where we're motivated by the same thing investors are motivated in, which is NAV per share growth and dividend growth. And we're not um, asset gatherers. We're, we're obviously motivated to grow the portfolio if we can, if we can do so on reasonable terms and, and create portfolio benefits. 
but we're not out there just trying to gather assets to make the portfolio larger. And we think that that's a, an important differentiator. Uh, we think there's quite a, a significant pipeline of opportunities. We've been able to grow significantly in the last decade, and we see no reason why that continued growth uh, discipline, but, uh, but tempered can't continue in the future. The reality is a lot of the uh, opportunities that we're currently considering, we can't really disclose because we're, we're often in uh, signing confidentiality agreements with prospective vendors. But here's some of the stuff we can talk about. We, we issued an RNS that we have uh, agreed to acquire a hospital in Montreal for 88 million Canadian dollars. That's going through the consent process and approval process. And we're hopeful that that will, will happen later this year. We have a, a strong portfolio of transportation and social infrastructure opportunities. Um, we acquired our first uh, green energy acquisition in Q1 of this year. It was uh, the John Hart Generating Station. It's an availability based, so we're not taking any power or commodity risk there. It's very much in line with our strategy, but it's it's consistent with the availability approach. And that came to us through a formal pipeline agreement we have with a, a major North American engineering and construction company. We've, we've bought uh, five assets from them now, including the, the John Hart uh, project. And we have a pipeline that gives us the option, but not the obligation to consider four more as they uh, become available. And then we're also looking at, um, uh, we're shortlisted on a transportation opportunity in, in, in Europe. Um, and we'll continue our uh, diligent work, reaching out to developers and construction companies that build these assets uh, to provide them a source of liquidity should they wish to sell. Just summarizing what, what Frank mentioned and just bringing it to a conclusion here, we have a low risk uh, resilient portfolio. So it's all availability based projects. We're in uh, typically AA and AAA rated countries. We're paid by strong governments. It's a sustainable uh, investment portfolio with, with very low climate risk within the portfolio. Uh, we've had a decade of strong performance and um, it's coming from socially beneficial projects so schools, hospitals, uh, transportation projects, affordable housing, all, all, all investments with a, with a strong social purpose. It has a low correlation to other asset types uh, and good, good inflation linkage. And as I mentioned, uh, good climate resilience within our portfolio. We've done a lot of climate, uh, climate testing this year and we can um, address that in the Q&A. So I wanna thank you for your time and interest and I'll turn it back to Nigel and we can hopefully get some of your questions. Well, thank you very much to both you, Duncan, and to Frank for very clear presentations about BBGI's strategy and impressive record. Now, we've got a number of questions, some of which have been submitted. The first one, and I'm working on the basis of asking questions alternately, but the first one perhaps is one for Frank. And the question that's been submitted is, should investors be concerned with the share price premium, which I think currently is about 23%, and how prudent is your net asset calculation? I think that's a very good question. And we hear this question quite often, actually, you know, so, uh, because 20% looks like a high premium. Um, maybe there's a couple of answers, and Duncan may want to add to, to that. Um, first of all, we have been trading at a substantial premium for a prolonged period of time, so 20 plus percent here is not unusual. You know, and then often we get a question, why is that? Um, obviously, that's that's the market, you know. So, and there, it's a bit of a luxury problem for us. But I think there are a couple of uh, ex ex at least um, explanations which we which actually goes in that direction to to, to explain it. Um, first of all, um, our evaluation we consider that conservative, and that is actually backed up by an opinion from both our independent evaluator here you know, and actually by our auditor, and we make that statement also publicly in our annual report. The second one is more a technical argument, but a very important one. Um, when we do the valuation, we do a so-called sum of the parts valuation. That means we value each asset individually and not actually as a portfolio. So if you buy a portfolio like that, you would certainly pay a portfolio premium for that. And you wouldn't actually uh, get that uh, for, the, for the valuation we actually used it. 
And that is that is just a peculiarity in, in terms of how you actually have to value that one, but it's an important one. So um, we believe that's that's an important one. The third one is some people look more at not actually the, at the at the premium. You know, they look at what is the yield and is the yield attractive? And we're yielding around 4.3-ish percent, 4.4%. Um, and we believe the yield is stable and reliable and also attractive in the current market, where you still get um, close to historical low, actually, um, interest rates. You know? And we are trading, you know, we are basically, we could describe ourselves as a hybrid, hybrid product between an interest product and actually an equity product, because we are because we're getting our revenues from public sector or public sector parties. Duncan, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I don't think you've done a good job describing it, Frank. Uh, a couple of points I would add is just on that portfolio effect is the some of the parts you, you did a very good job describing it. But what we also get is the investor gets the benefit of the hedging policy we put in place. They get the benefit of the active management that happens. So those all contribute to value, the internal management team, the origination capacity, um, and that's not really picked up when you do a, a, some of the parts valuation. So the, the synergies that come from the management team, the, the diversification benefits, and we, we don't put leverage on the portfolio, but if, if uh, private equity or an, a large institutional buyer were to value this, they could put additional leverage on there that we, we haven't considered. So, so that's perhaps uh, one of the reasons why the, the, the premiums uh, is large. We, we also get the question, well, you know, it's, it's, it's a large premium, but the, but the reality is we've always traded at a premium since IPO. There was a brief period of time in, in, when, when COVID hit in March 2020, uh, when that premium reduced as, as it did for everyone in the market uh, for about two weeks when there was uh, sort of some pandemonium, some chaos, but it quickly uh, moved back to a premium position. So we've we've really had 10 years of sustained premium. So it, it hopefully becomes less of a concern for people now than, 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 it, than it has been. Okay, thank you. A question for you now, Duncan. Are you likely to undertake further en energy investments after the recent Canadian hydro deal? We, we're very happy with the deal that we we just did. It came to us through the pipeline. It's it's a great asset. Um, if there were more to do like this, I think we would uh, certainly chase them. But the, the reality, I think this is a bit of a one off. Um, what's unique about this is it's it's clean energy, but it fits our availability style. So we're not taking any. Uh, pricing risk on power prices. We're not taking any hydrology risk on, on uh, how much water is flowing through the pipes and how much energy is being produced. It's, uh, so it's a, a little unique in that sense. We're getting paid. It's, it's essentially a series of underground pipes connecting to three uh, large turbines, 132 megawatt turbines. And when you open the flues and allow water to pass through, if if the technology works and the turbines turn, we get paid irrespective of how much water is flowing through and how much power is being generated. Um, so that's it's a bit of a, an anomaly. Most transactions aren't done done this way. It was a, a bit of a hybrid transaction done in British Columbia, um, and we we like it because we're paid by BC Hydro, which is a crown corporation, very strong credit rating. But I think this is. Um, We'd love to do more, but I think this is a bit of a unique transaction. Could you elaborate your foreign exchange heading strategy? And I accept possibly some maybe quite confidential. Are there any potential changes planned on your strategy for the future? Yeah, again, good question because um, we've got a global portfolio, and a global portfolio is only as good as your as you don't have actually foreign exchange volatility, you know, and uh, that's the flip side. But uh, we actually enjoy the diversification benefit, and we actually. actually I uh, think that that's the great, great actually uh, thing to have that we invest in AAA, double rated countries around the world. Um, the hedging strategy is important for us to reduce any potential volatility. And the aim of the hedging strategy is that we limit any sensitivity to 3%, any NEV sensitivity to 3% in case all currencies would move against the pound by 10%. And how do we achieve that? Um, we do two things we basically hedge our dividends on a rolling basis forward yeah, for four years. 
So all dividends payment for the next four years, you know, we have got a hedge in place, you know, and we renew these hedges on an annual basis. In addition, we do some balance sheet hedging, and the balance sheet hedging actually um, are tailored in the way that it reduces the sensitivity to the 3% for um, NEV, sensitive NEV change for a 10% change. Yeah, so that's the two elements. Yeah, and um, to date, actually, um, the, the, the total impact over the last 10 years, the net impact was only 2.7 pence per share you know, um, of foreign exchange, almost marginal, if you look at actually our NEV of 140 base, 140.7 pence per share. Okay, well, that's fine. Um, I have another question that's come um, in the last 50 minutes or so. Both of you may wish to say a little bit about this. It may be a short answer, perhaps. Are there plans to sell any of your assets? I mean, maybe I'll take that one. Um, we're very happy with the portfolio construction. Um, we take the view that um, if investors want liquidity, they can sell their shares in the market. There's a there's a, a deep market for the shares. They trade on a on a daily basis in, in significant numbers. So if someone wanted liquidity for the investment, they could do it that way. Um, it doesn't mean we would never consider, uh, but we're, we're very happy with the assets we have in the portfolio. We've recently just completed a climate resiliency uh, exercise where we looked at all the different assets and how they would perform under various, uh, we, we, we looked at eight different perils under three different climate scenarios uh, over uh, uh, multiple time frames. And we concluded, or the, or the experts that we retained to do this work for us concluded that uh, we have a very high resiliency uh, to climate risk within our portfolio. So there's no real stranded assets that we feel we need to sell. Um, so we're, we're very comfortable with the, the, the portfolio. I could see, you know, if we, if we acquired a group of assets and there was an asset that didn't fit our portfolio, we might sell. If someone offered us a crazy price on an asset, we would obviously uh, consider it. But I think the reality is we're very happy with the portfolio construction. So we have not sold an asset in the in the ten years, but it doesn't mean we we wouldn't consider it. But it just I, I don't think it's a high probability at the current time. Fine. How do you expect your long term investment to be split between your three major markets of North America, the UK, and the European Union over perhaps a ten year period? Do you expect to be majoring much more heavily in one of those three markets or not? Um, again, th this is a bit of a, probably a bit of a crystal ball gazing, but I'm looking back what, how it was or, um, 10 years ago. We have always been in Australia, you know, and there are probably slightly large, larger actually exposure. And we had UK a bit larger and Canada a bit slower, a bit, bit lower, um, and we had Europe. Yeah, so uh, we add in the last 10 years the US, you know, um, um, as, as a country, you know, but basically we have been in the, in the geographical areas here you know, um, since the last 10 years. So I wouldn't expect a major difference, but there's always a bit of ups and downs and it depends on the market because when some markets actually have got less, less actually pipeline here, you know, so you've got less opportunity to grow, but actually then actually that changes in, in, in waves where actually the countries may come back. Yeah, and there are, so um, overall, actually, I don't expect a fundamental change. Would also maybe importantly to state we wouldn't go into lesser risk and less or higher risk country or less rate less with the lower rating countries. You know, so um, <coughs> countries like actually Greece, even Italy, uh, wouldn't do that. We wouldn't go further east than actually uh, Poland. Yeah, you know, but even we would reconsider that, see that even in the current situation. You know, and we wouldn't go south actually of the of the U.S. Yeah, so that's basically describes actually on a universe. New Zealand is probably one country we may add here you know, if there was an opportunity here, you know, but uh, so very similar to Australia, but that's currently our universe. Right, thank you. Uh, there is another question, in fact, three questions, but consider within one quite long question. If I give the first one to Duncan, perhaps the second one to Frank, and the third one to Duncan. The first one for Duncan, how will the energy crisis that has emerged from the Russia Ukraine war impact the infrastructure sector in the next decade? And the one for Frank, part of the same long question, how does BBGI's WAC, or given it's not a regulated utility, more accurately perhaps its financial arrangements, compare with the other companies in the sector? And the last part of the question, which I think perhaps is for Duncan, how is the firm navigating the financing of infrastructure assets in this period of monetary 
tightening. I'll come back on the third one, Duncan, if I give you too much to do the first one. Okay, so the, the, the first one was dealing about uh, energy and its impact, uh, the impact received or felt from the Ukraine uh, Russian conflict. Um, I, I guess the, the the simple answer is we don't have any exposure to Russia. Uh, we don't have any uh, uh, counterparties that have uh, Russian ownership. So we're, we we did that analysis when the conflict broke out to make sure um, we we didn't have any knock on effects. Uh, so so that's for, first and foremost what we did. Um, Obviously, there may be opportunities as as Europe reconsiders its long term energy strategy um, as a result of the conflict. But I I think it's probably not something that we see as impacting us immediately. We we have the John Hart generating station, which is a clean energy asset. It's our first, but I I think the reality is we're our our core infrastructure is social infrastructure and transportation projects. I don't, I don't think you see us moving towards uh, renewables or energy assets. So I, I really can't say much more than that. Thank you. Uh, Frank, do you want to do with the WAC or equivalent question, how BBGI's financing compares with others in the sector? Sure, uh, maybe just to add actually to Dan's question, um, in case also energy price risk, we don't uh, take typically energy price risk. I mean, maybe that, maybe that was, was also part of the question. That is uh, sitting with either the public sector uh, or actually our subcontractors. And there's very minimal actually utility risk on our side. Um, so from that point of view, we are to a very large extent sheltered from any change in utility pricing. Um, in terms of your uh, question about the WAC, um, but the WAC probably is meant here the discount rate because we, we don't have really a WAC. Here. Um, so, and, and Duncan talked a little bit about the discount rate already. Um, the, the, the discount rates compa compared to the, uh, um, to the peer companies and they're especially to other peer companies, um, which are also listed. Um, and there, the, the point is you can't compare um, the valuations directly. You know, because we are the only one in the sector who, only, who has got 100% availability-based assets. And the other two peers in the sector have deviated from this strategy about five years ago, where they actually went into other risk areas like actually um, demand-based assets like toll roads or regulated-based assets like water companies or gas companies. So by definition, they should have got a higher discount rate uh, as they actually have, have a, um, a higher risk profile than we have. If you look at them, the rates, uh, the one of the closest peer actually is only slightly higher. You know, um, and that demonstrates um, that we are conservatively valued because there's not a lot of difference between our discount rate and the discount rate of that peer. And peer number two has got uh, uh, also higher discount rate, the highest discount rate of all the three in the sector. Um, and I would say here um, that reflects more the risk profile, but also the point that uh, that company has, has got projects which are uh, still within the construction, with the construction risk attached. And if I just go back to the third part of the question that I put originally to Duncan, I so I might repeat it because it's quite a lengthy question. How is BBGI navigating the financing on infrastructure assets in this period of monetary tightening? Yeah, I think it's it's a good question, and I want to just point out that all of our assets, uh, uh, save for one have full full duration um, financing in place. So it, it's fully amortizing over the course of the concession agreement. Uh, we have one asset where there's a tranche of long-term uh, financing and then a tranche of uh, shorter term financing. And we take the risk on the margin, but we don't take the base, uh, the base risk. Um, so we have very, very little refinancing risk within our portfolio. As I say, out of, out of 55 assets, only one has a tranche that's subject to refinancing. So we don't need to do any uh, re refinancing. We opportunistically uh, refinanced four assets this past year and, and benefited from low, low interest rates. So that was an upside that came from our asset, active asset management activities. But that's, but that, that's really just sort of icing on the cake it's it's it was taking advantage of low risks or low rates to uh to 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 get uh some 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 upside um 
we have a credit facility that we use, we draw down on um, to acquire new assets from time to time. And again, that has a four year facility. Um, so we're not having to rely on that. And we've uh, regularly come back to the capital markets and raised the race uh, when we have had drawings on that have come back and repaid it in, in, in short order. So uh, the, 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 the very short answer is that we don't think that there's much risk from us from raising, uh, you know, from tightening monetary policy. Could you clarify how the rise in inflation has been affecting your portfolio cash flows over the last 12 months or so? Maybe starting with, with, the, with the short answer on that and, and can give us a bit of lengthier explanation. Uh, but our portfolio has a positive inflation linkage of about 0.44%. That means um, if um, our if the inflation is 1% higher, yeah, then our assumptions, yeah, the portfolio return goes up by this 44 basis points. And how does that work? Um, we get actually the revenues from our public sectors and we got inflation compensation in that, in that, in that revenue mechanism. Uh, so therefore, if the inflation is higher, yeah, we get higher income. And the inflation is typically reset once per year. Yeah, so um, while, while the sensitivity we have given is 1% is, is or higher with a 44 basis point, we have in our annual results presentation also shown the sensitivity where we uh, show what is happening yeah, in case um, the inflation rates go to 5% for all jurisdictions. So, and if that happens, uh, we got an upside in our net present value or net asset value of about 26 and a half million. You know, so that's not reflected in our valuation because we are assuming um, for the different countries, um, uh, actually inflation rate, which are around 2.75 for the UK and then around 2% to 2.5% for the US. Yeah, and um, we have not adjusted that yeah, because they're long-term inflation. So we would expect actually for the next actually one to two years, if the inflation stays actually where it is as, as it currently are, and uh, that we have got some upside pot potential in our net asset value, which is not reflected in the current valuation. How much CapEx assets are required per annum by BBGI? And how are the CapEx payments split between BBGI and the asset user. In terms of the broad categories of assets within our portfolio, we have transportation projects, and then we have buildings, so schools, hospitals, other other forms of social infrastructure. The on most of the uh, building infrastructure, the life cycle risk is passed down to the operator, so their uh, their payment includes a payment that compensates them to carry out the life cycle over the course of that. So we pass that risk down and they, they manage that risk on our, on our behalf. Um, and on a building, it might be 40% of uh, the construction cost over the life of the concession as a, as a, as a rough ballpark. And you can imagine that's uh, replacing uh, parts on an elevator or uh, window systems or door systems or HVAC systems over the life of the asset. And that's sort of an ongoing uh, continuous maintenance. Uh, you might paint one year, you might do a carpeting in the next, et cetera. And that's, that's passed down. On the roads, it's a, a slightly different a risk profile. Uh, the, the total uh, CapEx is usually about just below 18, uh, below 20%, about 18% of the original concession value. On most of the road projects, we, we retain that risk um, and we manage it prudently. And on a road, you might have uh, routine ongoing maintenance. So it might be patching and cracking uh, asphalt but then you might have an overlay that happens typically twice during a concession period, maybe, maybe after year 10 or year 12, and then right before handback. And um, we've, we've managed that well across our portfolio. We have road specialists, engineers that understand that risk. And it's, it's been an area of, um, that, you know, that we're, we're quite, quite comfortable managing those, those costs. So hopefully that's answered the question. How have you managed to deliver a 10 year total shareholder return averaging over 10% per year, despite deploying such a low risk model? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, uh, and thanks for that. I think uh, the 10 years have, have gone quite well. Yeah, and why do, did it go well? Um, 
we, ha we have a slide actually, not in that presentation, but we have got a slide actually in the, in the annual results presentation uh, where we um, look at what are the key drivers for our returns here. You know? And the key driver, and where, where, why did actually the NAV go up you know? And um, the key driver actually what we deliver as a BBGI team is we do an active asset management. And uh, I think we delivered quite well on that one. We have about 30% of our NAV increases comes from the active asset management approach. Um, that means we're looking at, we have looked at refinancings. Last year alone, actually, we have done four creative refinancings where we made use of for good or attractive financing conditions you know, in the market. And that will to, to be important to note, actually, that's for voluntary refinancings. We are not actually were obliged to do refinance, but we took advantage of the good environment you know, and we refinanced that one. One example was that we refinanced um, on the higher river bridge projects, uh, 500 million of, of bonds, you know, and actually at a significantly lower rate than the carrying rate, you know, and so made, made it quite a good benefit. Um, we changed actually operators where we think actually we could get a better price. We managed actually um, the SPC cost, or means the project, project entities management cost, where we optimized that one. You know, and all in all, if you look at the different elements here, you know, that contributed quite well you know, um, to, to actually the return. Um, that, I think, is one of the key answers to that. Is ESG still a priority for BBGI? Yeah, I think ESG is a priority for everyone. Um, different investors view it differently, but we're, we're very proud of the work that happens in the portfolio. We're doing uh, a, a lot to consider climate change. There's a social alignment with the work we do, schools, hospitals, uh, innovative infrastructure. So, and we are, uh, you know, it will continue to be a focus uh, if, if, if for no other reason, the legislative, legislative framework is making it much more important. We're, uh, we've done our second year of voluntary disclosure under the TCFD, the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure. We're regulated in the EU and there's new legislation there called Sustainable Finance uh, Directive, the SFDR. So there's a lot of ESG that has to happen, but we also think it's it's the right thing to do. It, it um, We also think it's an opportunity where we can do well by doing uh, good. We, we think that there will be opportunities with our client, public sector clients to make these assets even more resilient to climate change, uh, put in place um, uh, opportunities for change orders that can make the buildings more resilient, but also uh, earn fees for doing so. And then I guess finally, um, the, the other aspects, ESG, it's not just climate, but it's, it's also social and, and governance. Uh, there's a strong correlation between good government governance and, and uh, shareholder performance. So we think it's the governance models that we put in place at the various projects are, are a good proxy for how well we're managing the, 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 the assets. And as Frank said, the, the re real driving force over the last decade has been active asset management, and that comes with good governance. And then finally, the social aspect, um, we think that there's... Uh, Health and safety is very important. These are these are active assets. We've got to deliver on that. We've got to treat our people fairly if we want to be a, a, a favored employer and have have the ability to attract talent. So all these things interact to create an environment where we think ESG will continue to be um, important in the future. Well, thank you very much. I think that concludes the presentation and the Q and A session. So thank you again to our speakers and to our attendees. I hope you've all learned something from the forum about BBGI and how well it's done over the last few years. And we look forward to seeing you again at future Arden functions. Thank you very much.